everyone here might know it. Uh, but um, uh, he's a, a, a professor of one of our institutes of LHC. Uh, no, no, no from this year. Okay. Anyway, thank you. And let's let's say hello to. to Different characteristics, 
publishers might want to know about it uh, in their, in their uh, books on target audiences, broadcasters who uh, broadcast in a specific region of the country, and educators, educators as well, so which people have uh, problems with different uh, pronunciation, for example. So, usually in dialectology, uh, so how people started off with was to draw iso so-called isoglosses. Who knows what an isogloss is? Yeah, most, right? So that's good. And I'm at least sitting in the correct chair. Yeah? So, uh, this really was a primary tool, right? So it's a line which simply maps the boundary between uh, using one variant or the other variant. Uh, so here we have an example, and I will show you lots of examples of Dutch. So after this course, you will learn lots about the Dutch language, right? So uh, my university is about here. Uh, so this is the Netherlands here. This uh, is like a lion-esque uh, shaped country. And here we have Nantes, right, which is uh, a part of uh, Belgium, and it's a Dutch-speaking area. Right? So what you see here is uh, three different variants of uh, Rijp, Rijp. So it's either Riepe, uh, Rijp, or it's Riep. And they use Riepe in this area, they use Rijp, which is a standard Dutch form in this area, and they use, uh, 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 so this is Riep, and this is Riepe in the, the West Flanders uh, region. Okay, so then we have, uh, have these isoglosses which denote uh, the borders between the different varieties. So then we have a different uh, word, say, let's say cold, right? It's cold here, which is, resembles the German variant a bit, and it's koud here, which is the standard Dutch variant. Okay, so now let's see if we take these two words together. Okay, then we have ripe and cold, and you see that there are multiple isoglosses now, right? And they are not necessarily overlapping. Yeah, so, but what happens if you take even more? Right, so if you, what, what would happen if you take 14, right, which is still not too much, but 14 phenomena in an isoplasma. So we have werk versus werk, we have which is work, we have a splinter, which is also with this tiny piece of wood in your finger, splinter versus uh, the other type of R, we have knee versus knee, we have all these kinds of different variants in one hand. So what do we get? Well, we get this. Right. It looks like a mess, huh? I mean, sometimes you see uh, isoglosses which overlap, right here, for example, and here as well, which makes sense. I mean, there's a different language spoken in this area. Uh, there's also a clear language border here, because here we have a low Saxon dialect, and here we have low Franconian dialect, so you see some structure, but it's, it's really a mess. And this is only 14 features, only 14 words. And I work with hundreds of words, right? So you can guess what, you really cannot use this. Yeah? So the isoglass method is, I mean, it's useful to, the, to determine the borders between a single feature, but not so much if you have uh, many. So, the advantage of this isoglass method is that the results are verifiable, right? You can simply uh, look at uh, uh, this location and you can simply check, hey, does this person who lives there say, say cold? Right? So it's verifiable. But there are clear disadvantages, right? So uh, isoglosses do not always coincide. Uh, actually, they almost never coincide, right? uh, as you saw. Uh, they may run parallel, they may cross, uh, and by only selecting coinciding isoglosses, right? For example, I could say, well, I'm picking these three, right? Because they, they match nicely the border I would want to find. Or I'm only picking these because they also nicely match the border I would like to find. But then it becomes subjective, right? And the whole idea, what I will illustrate uh, during this lecture of dialectometry, is that, that we want to move away from the subjectivity. But we don't want to say, no, let's pick this feature and this feature, and yes, we find a nice division between the two dialects, which we of course already know. We really want to see what the data tells us. Uh, also, sharp boundaries cannot always be drawn with these isoglosses, and you can see transition zones, and that's also something we might want to detect, right? Might not always be the case that you want to identify clear cut dialect borders. Right? So in that sense, it's, it's not really a disadvantage. But we will see a method which also allows for that. So, now, why would we use 
dielectrometry. What is dielectrometry? Well, we want some kind of methodolo methodology, which is purely linguistic, like the words of linguistic data, that is used for all linguistic uh, levels, so phonetics, semantics, uh, syntactic, sy syntax, etc., etc., lexical variation. It can be processed and representative, and also a big data set. And it includes all data without any subjective selections. It utilizes the data maximally, so we use all the data we have, and it produces results which are unambiguous. And the nice thing is that dielectrometry satisfies these criteria. So, now, finally, the question of this uh, what is dielectrometry? And after this, you're free to be fair if you think you're in the so, Jean Soudy, who was the director of the Atlas Linguistic de Gascogne, he introduced this term dialectometry. Right? And it's, mer it's a merger of dialectology, right? the study of dialects, and metry, which means measuring something. So we measure dialects in a sense. So, and precisely, dialectometry quantitatively measures dialect difference with a focus on identifying geographical patterns in of dialect variation, so in our data, right? So we quantitatively measure something and we focus on geography. Right? That's essentially dialect of At least uh, it was until, say, uh, a decade ago. So the nice thing of this <coughs> aggregation step, right, so by combining many features, is that the geographical signals are strengthened. Um, and there's no cherry picking of features. Right. So I cannot say as a researcher, I like this feature, this feature, and this feature, and then I will see the pattern what I already know exists. So we don't have to do that anymore. So geographical modeling in dialectology is also special, right? Because there's always a geographical pattern in the data, right? We study language varieties which are closely related, which are often geographically close. Right? And of course there's contact, which means that the language varieties are similar. Right? Because nearby speakers tend to speak more similarly than those living apart. That doesn't always hold, right? I mean, there might be a big mountain range in between and uh, two different varieties are completely different. But, I mean, usually this works out to be the case. And that's, uh, the, I think, the strength of dialectometry, which also assumes that there's this geographic proximity. So, how do we start? Well, we start with dialectometry, since we're measuring stuff, by quantifying. Right? So we want to measure dialect differences. So, the essence is that we have a set of data, which contains locations. Right? If you do field work, those are the locations where you collected your data. Right? And usually if you do field work, you collect pronunciations or lexical variants or what have you of many different things, not only one, right? Because if you're already there, why wouldn't you collect lots of data? So, we have different pairs of sites, and for all the different pairs of sites, we want to get a measure which reflects how different these are linguistically. Are linguistic. Right, so that's the idea of what we are going to do. So we have some kind of measure, 
which gives us, after we have included all our data into every two places, we have a quantitative measure indicating how different they are linguistic. Okay. So, but we have lots of pairs, right? So, if we have uh, 400, uh, or if we have 100 locations, we have 100 times 99 divided by 2, that's about, say, 5,000 of these uh, place comparisons. Right? So, 5,000 differences. <coughs> so, at least all these linguistic differences between two locations, that's simply the average of all our items. Right? So, for every item, we determine uh, how different they are. And then we average that over all the items to get uh, the difference between the two different places. And I will show examples. So then we get the place times place table of dialect differences. And then we want to do stuff with it. And we will see that. So there's many researchers who have been uh, working on dialect function. So since the 1970s, there was Hans Goebel uh, from the 1980s onwards. Uh, John Nerbon was my PhD supervisor from the 1990s onwards. Uh, and many others. Uh, and my main focus in this lecture is differences in pronunciation. Right? But I'll show you also some examples of differences in lexical variation. Uh, and you can use it for all the uh, for all types of uh, uh, data collected in linguistics. So is this clear so far? Okay, so now let's go to pronunciation differences because that's my say my cup of tea. Uh, so if you have pronunciation differences, so transcriptions in the International Phonetic Alphabet, and we want to know how different two pronunciations are, so what do we do? Well, it's, uh, uh, what's one of the most popular methods is actually called the Levenstein distance. Vladimir Levenstein, I think he's a Russian, no? The, the paper is in Russian. Russia. Yeah, he's uh, Russian. Sorry? Yeah, he's Russian, Russian but right. he's... Yeah. So this paper was written in, uh, in about 1964, and uh, it's also called the edit distance. So it's simply the minimum number of insertions, substitutions, and deletions to transform one string, which can be either in phonetic uh, segments, but it can also be simply uh, an alphabetic string, or a Cyrillic string, uh, into the other. And I will give you an example of the Levenstein distance, but it's important to note that this measure, which is relatively sim sim Simple, right? It simply denotes how different are uh, the different pronunciations in terms of their segments. Uh, it correlates well with perceptual dialect differences. Right? So, Ronald Hierika, who was also a PhD student at our institute in Koning, uh, before me, he went to, uh, I think, our, uh, they collected data in uh, Scandinavia, and there uh, they looked at how uh, they, well, they transcribed all the pronunciations. Uh, and they asked high school kids, how different is this dialect from your own? Right? And they correlated uh, the measures which they found with the Levenstein distance. Right? So they have lots of items calculated for every location A and B for every item. Uh, the difference, right? they did that for all the items, average them, so they have a measure of distance between a linguistic distance between A and B. And they do that for all the pairs and correlated that with the perceptual distances. And they found a correlation of about 0.7. Only thing there were only 13 sites, right? So there's not too much uh, uh, data there. So in, uh, a while ago, we conducted a study on uh, Dutch accents or uh, English accents. So you have this, uh, it's called the Speech Accent Archive. Uh, it's a big data set of accented English speech. Uh, everybody is pronouncing the same paragraph of text. So please call Stella, ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow, these five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for a rubber ball. And it goes on like this. And you can see that I've read it for many, many times since I really know it by heart. And you can also hear my uh, Dutch accent right in this pronunciation. Uh, so we have about, uh, I think, about 900 uh, of these uh, 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 samples, which we simply got from the author on the website. It's, it's uh, stored at George Mason University. Uh, and uh, what we did is, uh, they all had transcriptions, right? So we had the audio files and the transcriptions, and we calculated our uh, accent differences compared to average American English, right? So you have in this data set lots of uh, uh, pronunciations of Chinese people, Russian people, Dutch people, French people, etc. They were all transcribed. So what did we do? So we calculated our 
are linguistic differences with respect to pronunciation from each of the individual speakers in the data set to all of the, I think, 130 speakers of American English. And there's lots of dialect vari variation there. If you want to get the most, uh, say, uh, average American English speaker, you go to Canada. Right? <laughs> they have, uh, I mean, they, they well. So but we had 130 or so, so we calculated for every speaker, say a Dutch speaker uh, with an English, uh, in English with a Dutch accent, we calculated the difference compared to all of the 130 American English speakers, and we took the average of that. And then we said, well, this is approximately the average, the distance, pronunciation distance from this individual speaker to average American English. And you can have all kinds of criticism on based on that, but I mean, given that we have 130 uh, American English speakers, all from different regions throughout the US, I think from all of the 50 states, I, I think it, it's a, a fairly uh, good assessment. So what we then did, we made a questionnaire. And in this questionnaire, we had an online questionnaire. We had 50 audio samples. So of this, please call Stella Paragraph. So what we asked the participants is to rate every sample on how native-like it is. So in all of these 50, there were a few of Native American English speakers, and the rest simply of the of uh, non-native speakers. OK, so then I set out the questionnaire. I sent it to all my friends. And then after, I think, two weeks, I had 20 or perhaps 30 people filled in the questionnaire. And then I sent it to Mark Limmerman of Language Log. He was in my dissertation committee. And I asked him, hey, perhaps can you put this, uh, this uh, questionnaire on Language Log? I don't know if you do you know Language Log? Probably, yes. If you don't. Look at it, it's really nice, a uh, nice blog about linguistics, language blog. Okay, so then I, I asked him, uh, I think a few months ago, uh, uh, I did not get a reply. And then at one point I looked at the questionnaire results and I saw I had 350 participants who, who filled in the questionnaire. I thought, what is going on? And I, the, the reason why I found out that there were so many uh, people filling in the questionnaire was that I got, on one day I got two questions about the questionnaire. And I thought, hmm, but I sent the email already, say six weeks ago, what's happening? Then I looked and then I thought, oh my god, I have so many uh, people filling it in. So I replaced the 50 uh, audio samples with 50 new ones. I waited the data and again had about 300 uh, uh, ratings. And I replaced it again and again and again. And it turned out that in the end we had 1,200 people who filled in the complete questionnaire, right? So we listened to all of the 50 uh, samples. So we had lots of uh, ratings. So for every speaker, we took the average uh, of the, the rating scores. And we correlated that with our uh, linguistic left machine based perception distances and correlated at uh, 0 0.81. Right? So, this left machine distance, although it's simple, it really seems to reflect perceptual distances. Because then you might ask, but how well do people agree? Well, people agree of, with an average correlation of 0 0.84. Right? So, if you ask one person how native like this is, the other person how native like this is, they will agree 0 0.84, their ratings. And our measure correlates to 0 to 81. So it's really not really good. Do you have a question? OK, so it correlates well with perceptual uh, dialect distances. And this is 0 0.7, but it's really only based on, on, uh, on uh, only a few uh, dialects. This was based on a few hundreds and 0 to 8. So I would say that this Lemachine uh, method really reflects perceptual distances quite well. So and now, how do we calculate this Lemachine distance? Well, very simple. We have two pronunciations here of uh, dialectal variants of the Dutch word milk, molke, and melk. Right? And what the left machine distance does, it simply counts how many operations do I need to transform this string into the other one. So if you first do it, you delete the off, right, and you have uh, milk. Then we substitute the schwa with the app and we have milk. We delete the schwa and we have milk, and then we insert the schwa and then we have milk. So there's four operations in total here. And these are also all the three operations we have done. Deletion, substitution, and insertion. There is a, a Delmarobe left machine distance, which then also uh, contains the transposition. Right? So if you have, for example, wasp and wops, right, where the P and the S are flipped, that's one operation, but we'll use a simple one here. So this left machine distance also uh, generates an alignment. Right? So an alignment means uh, simply putting them underneath each other, if it's a deletion, you will have a, a segment here and nothing here. If it's a substitution, you will have different segments here. And if it's an insertion, you will have nothing here and a segment here. Right? So you can see there are four operations. So and then what's the, 
how do we quantify this? Because you would say, well, if you have four, then simply if you have longer strings, it's more likely to have differences. Yes. And that's why we, need, uh, we divide it by the alignment length. Right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven positions here. Uh, so we have the leveraging distance of four, and we divided it by seven for the alignment positions. So we get a leveraging distance, normalized leveraging distance of 0 0.757. And the nice thing is that this Levenstein distance generates you automatic sound correspondences. Right? You can see by having lots of words and lots of locations how often certain sounds uh, correspond together. Right? So how often does the schwa and the F occur, co-occur? Right? We can count it. So now given that we have one Levenstein distance for one word between two places, what can we then do? Well, we can calculate the aggregate Levenstein distance between uh, two places. Right? So here we have some Dutch uh, two uh, Dutch places, Middelstuk and Onno, right? And we have different items here: ship, cap, cold, jump, cellar, and house. Right? I usually have 600 or so, but uh, six will do the job as well. And what we uh, have is the pronunciations, so the transcriptions in IPA. So here it's ship, and Onno it's ship as well. And what you see is the Lambertine distance is zero because they're identical. Alignment length will be four, so that it's still zero divided by four is zero. You have the uh, cat, so pet and petter, right? The Lambertine distance will be one because there's only this difference. Length of the alignment will be four, so it's one four zero to twenty five. And we can do that for all the different uh, words, right? So we get all normalized Lambertine distances, right? We can sum them for all the six, so it's one point thirty seven. Sum all this. I hope I did the calculation correctly. I really have no idea. Uh, the distance is then 1.37, right? This value divided by the number of words. So the average Lebensian distance is 0.22. Right? So the difference, you can also say in percentages, it's 22.8 percent. Yes. When you get these words, um, are they all from reading text, or are you able to? I'm sure you'll get into this, but be able to elicit similar sentences in just natural speech. Yeah, so it really depends on your data set. You can, essentially, I don't care what my data is. Uh, so usually the data I work with, uh, the Dutch data, what they did was uh, uh, somebody went with a tape recorder yeah. to people's homes, yeah. and then they asked, how would you pronounce uh, uh, in standard Dutch this word in your document? Right? And then they had a discussion and they said, well, sometimes they immediately said it, and sometimes, this is the funny thing about these dialect uh, atlases, sometimes the guy, or mostly guy, right, norms, non-mobile, older rural males, right, so they went to small places where people had lived their entire life and they took the men because they have more traditional speech, uh, less innovative than the women, and then they asked uh, for dialects. But of course the interviewers had also some ideas about the dialects, right, and then this, this guy said, yeah, it's this word. And then the, the interviewer said, are you sure it isn't the other word? Right? And then sometimes they, they flipped. But, uh, it's, so it was in an interview based setting. Okay. But it was not spontaneous speech where okay. people simply elicited the words and <coughs> okay. it. Right? But sometimes it happens and you can also use that and then you transcribe that. It's yeah. a different type of data. Yeah, question. Right. It's actually something marvelous. Actually, what you show is it sounds like you uh, elicit uh, your data from one speed or from one village or something. But since then, it actually could be recalled, not dialectometry, but electrometry, since we could do the same stuff with the people from the one village, for instance, and we try to do the same stuff, and the result will be quite the same. And yeah. we also the distance between the yeah, so people. The reason why it's dialectometry is that it's, it started with dialects, right? But yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. simply measuring differences in yeah. well, whatever linguistic. Uh, Constructed ones, and you can also measure it within a village. But then, so the dialectometry part is really that you then take into account geography, right? And if you collect data only in a single village, for example, if you're interested in differences between men and women or young and old, right? It's in the social linguistics rather than the houses there. Sorry? You have houses there, so yeah. Sure. If you have the exact coordinates of the houses, then you can also take that into account. And then usually we're interested more in the higher level, right? Yeah, I know you But yeah, not preventing you at all from doing it in one village and then actually saying there's this house, this house, this house, and this house, and you can make a map of the village how people speak. Yeah, certainly. Well, probably Tom, like you are. So yeah.
Or probably like off a town, like yeah. you will like this. Yeah, so you could have in a town where there's different uh, religions, for example, right? So you have a church here and a church here, and people speak differently. That's something you could certainly do as well. Right, as long as you have a geographical coordinates. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the, the, the base method you can use always, even if you have no geographical coordinates. Is there, is there good literature on measuring semantic and syntactic differences using the Levenstein? Uh, no, so you, you, would, you would not use a definition for that. So okay. with semantic and syntactic differences, you would either use uh, simply same or different, okay. or perhaps if there's some kind of ordinal uh, yeah. scale, then yeah. you would use something which is equally spaced or something. Okay. Or, uh, yeah. that's, that's what I would use. Yeah. So this is really only if you have uh, pronunciation. Yeah. In example, you know, the example here of the how to go from model to man, yeah. um, you have two dollars, so you have Yes. Yes. Excellent, question. Question. Excellent question. You're asking why is it not positioned here? Yes, if you care about the alignment, why you yes. choose that? Uh, no, so we will get to that. But it's, uh, yeah, so the, the leverage distance actually will give you two alignments, namely this one and the one where the air is aligned with the off. Right? So it's always one to one, right? So you can, in leverage, you can never have two vowels to one. It's simply not possible. It would be a, it's an insertion followed by a deletion followed by a substitution, or it would be a substitution followed by a deletion. But, and the details don't uh, matter that much. But yeah, the very true. This one could be positioned here as well. So I've positioned it now here because I like it more. Right? I have a schwa, but I mean, it's uh, it's uh, there's no way in the, the uh, regular Levinsky distance to distinguish. Right? It doesn't know. It, it doesn't have any linguistic information. Except, so the only linguistic information we put in is that vowels may not align with consonants. Okay. Right? But then you have semi-vowels and you have uh, sonorant consonants which can uh, align, but pure consonants, pure vowels are not allowed to align. But that's the only linguistic information which we put in. Okay. So yeah, the system is, is quite good uh, in that sense. So that when you get it, like, in, uh, if you do it automatically, you have these two alignments and then you see statistically which one is more common or something like that. You can do that, but it, 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 so it's also a point I will, I will make later on is that uh, so in, in dialectometry we're aggregating, right? We have many different items and then we add and then we average over different items, uh, etc. And I would make the claim that it really doesn't matter what kind of measure you use. So even if you would use handing distance, right, which is completely utterly stupid, it would simply put this whole string here, right? All behind, one behind each other, and the other one, other string underneath the other one, right? No substitutions, whatever. Then you get also some kind of distance which is not as good as the Levinstein, that's clear. But at a higher aggregation, that will probably not make a difference. Which is what we'll see later because we, we did uh, more sensitive measures and it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Okay, so we get this average distance now. So this, these steps are all here, so we can get some kind of average. Yeah. And if you have lexical differences or syntactic differences, what you would normally get is you would have items here, and they're simply similar or different. Right? Are the same or different? So in this case, it would be the same. In this case, it would be different. Right? If you would simply say that these are different lexical values, <coughs> if, if there is a difference. So you would then have this one is the same, this one is different, 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 different. So we have five out of six which are different. And the distance, the linguistic distance between the two locations is then simply 5 out of 6. Right? So all the rest holds, uh, but simply this is a little bit more sensitive. Okay, so this relates to your question. We actually looked at how can we make this a little bit more linguistically informed, because this is really not very linguistically informed, right? I mean, the distance between this deletion of the all and the insertion of the schwa is identical. If we would substitute this, it's a distance of one. And, but if we would substitute this one, it's also the same, right? Whereas if you, if you, if you think about it, if I have a dialectal variant where I have the, 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 the vowel A, and I have another one where instead of the A there's an E, uh, and then I have another dialectal variant where instead of the A I have an A, you would say, well, the I and the R are much more similar, right? And the I and the E are really different. So, is there a way to actually uh, put this in? Well, you can manually put in substitution weights, but I, I, I don't like manual. But I, 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 it takes time. And then it's still subjective, right? So, what we do is we try to find a method which automatically, on the basis of your own data, 
identifies uh, these segment substitution costs. So it's based on pointwise mutual information, and that simply looks at how often does every individual segment or every pair of segments co occur. And the idea is simply you count how often uh, do the segments uh, occur by themselves. So how often do you see an M? How often do you see an O? How often do you see an M? So what's the percentage of the M's? What is the percentage of all the sounds of the O's? You multiply that with the, so if you have that too, uh, so you want to know how often the R, the schwa and the R align, you simply count what's the relative proportion of the schwa's, what's the relative proportion of the S, we multiply those two together, and that's the relative proportion you would get of aligned schwa's and S if they would have no relationship, right? Just by random chance you would expect them to co-occur that often. So we divide that by, our, sorry, the, the numerator is the, the probability of <coughs> in total alignments. We divide by, by the probability of them in the occurring. If you get high values, that means that uh, they are more likely to occur, co occur together than by chance. If you get low values, the opposite. And then you have some kind of measure uh, of how different they are. And then, in fact, you will see that this one is actually the better option because the schwa and the f co occur more often together than the o and the f. And this is an iterative procedure. So, what you do is you generate uh, your alignments based on that machine. You simply count how often uh, everything co occurs. You calculate now uh, pairwise distance, uh, pairwise uh, differences between the different sounds, right? So, we get the distance between. Uh, schwa and R of say 0.20 in the first iteration, then we review the whole thing, right? Because initially, in this case, we have two alignments, right? This one can, this, the R can also be positioned here. And we repeat that, we repeat that with the new uh, uh, sound segment substitutions until they do not change anymore, right? And once they have converged, you have your uh, sound distances. And in this case, it's something like this. And then you have, of course, smaller distances, and you normalize by uh, not only the length, but also the average uh, distance. And this, uh, so we obtain segment distances, we get in such a procedure, actually uh, match uh, acoustic distances quite well. Right? And uh, I'll show that here. So here we have the IPA vowel chart, right? Here we have acoustic, so this is on the basis of Dutch, so this is the acoustic chart on the basis of different data. But acoustic charts, and this is the MDS chart of PMI distances. So how you should read that? Well, uh, the orientation really doesn't matter. I can rotate it any way I want. Uh, so I rotate it, of course, to make sure that the front is front vowels are here, the E, the back vowels are here, the U, and the A is below, right? So that you see that it's some similarity. But so what you, well, what you can see is that it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's not bad. Right? You see the A-like sounds here, you see the U and the back sounds all close together. I mean, the, the U is, well, that should be much more here. It's not perfect, but it's reasonable. Right? So we get correlations of about, uh, I think, uh, between 06 uh, uh, and 0.8. Right? So correlations between the vowel distances on the basis of acoustics versus uh, this PMI basement. And the PMI based method has no linguistic information, right? It's simply counting how often in dialectal pronunciations do sounds align. Yeah, question? Uh, I, I didn't get uh, how did you, in the previous slide, uh, is, uh, this 0 0.12 uh, number. Yeah. As I see, it's just a correlation of nothing and a schwa? Or yeah, that's uh, how often uh, you have a schwa which is deleted and how often a schwa which is inserted. And the numbers are the same because, uh, yeah. Uh, you don't know which one is up, right? Because uh, if you, you simply want to have a distance between two words, uh, two word pronunciations, well, it, you can either put the first one above and then it's a deletion, or you can put the other one above and it's, then it's an insertion. So what you do, you use uh, both. Why? Why do we say that uh, these two segments uh, they, they grow separately? It's not. Uh, schwa or oh, oh, no, no, this R versus schwa uh, plus O. Oh, yeah. Why do you treat them separately? Yeah, yeah because it's a, it's a segment based uh, it's a segment based method, so it simply treats every individual segment as something separate. Mm -hmm. So if you want to group them, you could. You could say it's uh, it, it, this is one thing, the O and the schwa, and then and if we know about the and so on. Yeah. 
you can you can treat uh, treat them as shepherds. Yeah, uh, we didn't, but we can. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I didn't get uh, why the numbers are the same because if we have different legs, in, uh, for instance, in one leg, everybody leg fine uh, just. Uh, uh, in every word, last try is uh, down. In that case, the correspondence will be going to be in one. No, way, so you, on two. Yeah, so you could have asymmetry, uh, but you cannot. I mean, I can see why you would, in some cases, have asymmetry, but uh, the, in these alignments, so you have two locations, A and B, right? But if you compare A to B, you would always see that the Schwarz dropped, right? But if you would compare B to A, you would always see that the Schwarz inserted. Right, and you would use them both because the, which one is up, right? So yeah, I, I get this, but, but I'm, I'm not sure I like this way of thinking. Uh, it's well, probably, maybe. it's, it's, so I'd like to know uh, uh, the distance, if we measure one village with another, comparing, because for me the order is matter. I yeah, yeah, no, uh, I, I completely agree and we thought <coughs> sure about it, but it, so in the context of the dialects it doesn't necessarily matter so much because you don't know which one you compare, but if yeah, you have yeah, languages, yeah. right, so the language of origin and then the other one which has changed compared to that, then there is an ordering, right, and then uh, the, the method will give you this, uh, the, the, the asymmetry, simply because uh, you put one up, right, which is your, the language you compare to, Right, and the other one down, so then you will have asymmetry because then how often a schwa is deleted will differ from how often a schwa is inserted. But for our approach here, we always use uh, the one language at the top and one language at the bottom because there's no clear uh, uh, comparison, there's no obvious comparison which one uh, should be your reference variety. Right, but you can, and mm -hmm. it's simply a question of counting. I have another question about the distance, because when you get in this method, you get the result are really language dependent. Yes. So my idea was, uh, is it possible, because we, we've done some work on, on this, to try to create Levinstein distance between words that is not uh, language dependent, just using, for instance, phonological features, as yep. uh, how many phonological features do you need to change? To get the yeah. numbers. So front versus back and all these things. Yeah, no, uh, uh, so Wilbert Heringa has done this in his uh, thesis. He looked at that, he saw that it did not really make a difference. So the question is, at what level are you interested? Right? Are you interested in differences at the word level? So if you want to get uh, distances or differences, linguistic differences only by looking at one word, it matters what the method is, right? Simply because uh, it will change your results. If you look, if you are interested at in differences between locations, right? So aggregating over many items, it doesn't matter. Uh, it really mm -hmm. doesn't. So all these tiny differences, they filter out at the higher level. Mm. Yeah, and that's. I mean, it's it's a bit sad, right? Because we put a lot of effort in this, making something which is linguistically sensible. So now we have a measure which is linguistically sensible, which we can sell to the dialectologist, right? Because Dialectology and dialectometry, that's not something which, you, so you would say that the words are very similar, so they collaborate a lot, they don't, right? It's really, uh, especially social linguistics and dialectometry, that's really two different camps, right? Social linguistics focuses on single features, single uh, items, not many, uh, not big aggregation, and they are interested in social factors, etc. so geography is already a bit separate, but the techniques are not, not shared. So we thought we have to make it a bit more linguistically intuitive because if we say something like this, so the, 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 yes, I, I see your hand. Uh, uh, so if we do something like this, they say, but this is completely and utterly bullshit, right? Why would you say that this is equally distant as, as this? Right? There's no reason. So we made it linguistically more nice, and then still the results are the same. So it's a bit. Uh, mm. yeah. uh, can you also make uh, pairs like uh, O versus E? Context dependent, meaning that we like probably multiply the counts by the context. Like it often happens after certain kinds of consonants. It usually doesn't happen in other. Like, yeah, so that's context. a good that's a good question. So if if this can be made context dependent, in principle, yes. Uh, but then the the question becomes if you have enough data. 
right? Because if you make it context dependent, the question is do you have enough data to actually get reliable uh, distances between all these uh, sound pairs? So you can certainly do that, right? Because you can simply say that rather than having all these sound, sound se separate, you can say I'm having, uh, you're making bigrams, for example. Uh, and all, and then uh, and, and, and then uh, so you, you make every individual element, right? You make that a sequence of two sounds, and then you align those. Uh, but yeah, I think the problem will then be that you have too little data to actually say something. We have a lot of data for this type of uh, work, but uh, yeah, for, if you if you make it context dependent, I think you will have too little. Especially if you have, I mean, these data sets where so this this example is there's. Uh, uh, millions and millions of comparisons here because uh, it was uh, we have format words uh, so that's uh, 400 times 300 that's about uh, say six, uh, it's sixty thousand comparisons right and all the comparisons have about, uh, we have format words say so sixty thousand times four hundred that's uh, what is it uh, 24 million or something, and then every segment or every word has about five segments, right? So it's about 120 million uh, comparisons. But yeah, if you make it context dependent, you would still have this 100, uh, you would have half probably 60 million comparisons because if you have uh, two segments uh, next to each other, you would divide it by half, but then you would have uh, too few co occurrences of all the different pairs. Because of course, rather than 80 sounds we would have now, you would have 80 times 80 different possible combinations, right? So and if you have, then, then you don't have uh, differences between 80 sounds, but you would have differences between, say, 6,400 pairs and 6,400 pairs, which probably would give you too little data to say something meaningful, even with this amount of data. Uh, and what kind of, uh, and what amount of data is required to to do this? And is it at all possible? No. So to, to yeah. So. Too? So you would probably uh, ask specific questions, and then it's possible, right? So if you're interested in specific uh, uh, segments following each other, right, then you could simply merge the, those two and count the co-occurrences. But if you would simply want to know at all, I would say uh, don't bother. But this data set was, so the Dutch data set was collected in 15 years yeah, by a big team of people uh, going to uh, many, many locations. And you probably will not have enough data. So even if you would use crowdsourcing, uh, still, uh, getting the transcriptions would be no. I would not do it. Uh, you can, but uh, yeah, uh, I would <coughs> ask very specific questions. Right? So, if you're specifically interested in two two segments uh, which co-occur, but not in general. More questions? So, t until what time does this lecture last? Actually, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay, so then uh, I'll, I'll just, do you want to break or can I continue, what do you think? I mean, I don't know what the usual system in Russia is, do you have like... The usual system does not have break, but if the students want it, then... Yeah, you don't have breaks? Okay. I usually do have breaks, but uh, well, we'll have a break at uh, 15 minutes, and we're going in a fairly uh, okay pace, I think, right? Is this too fast or is it okay? Okay, so nice differences, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, you need a lot of effort. It was a nice journal publication, but still, it doesn't really matter. If you look at an aggregate level. So now I will show you some examples and some maps. Right? Uh, so the data we use in this example, and uh, when you uh, later on work on uh, uh, the data, you will also, can also use this data to also make different types of data. So there's lexical data as well, there's data from Britain, uh, no, no data from Russia, so I don't have that. But I'm sure that you have your own data, which uh, at the end of the course you will be able to uh, inspect in this dialectometric way. Because all of this, right, so Levenstein distance, you don't have to do it manually. We have a program which all does it automatically. Right? So all the next slides I'm showing you, you simply have to put in your table and uh, a map, right, which contains your locations, and then you get everything for free. No programming required, nothing whatsoever. Uh, okay, so Dutch pronunciation data. So here we use 562 words uh, and 424 varieties in the Netherlands. Uh, and this was, uh, so we published the analysis in uh, uh, yeah, almost a decade, no, more than a decade ago. So that's how you know you're getting old. 
okay, but uh, so you can read it. It's, it's always available on my uh, website. So all my publications, if you're interested, you can simply go to uh, my Google for my name and then uh, find my website, and there's all the publications. For free, you don't have to pay. So here you see the Netherlands, right? Uh, so I'm from the province of Groningen, the university is about here, so we don't have a data collection site there. The reason for that is that they picked small locations. Right? So Groningen is a big city, or I mean, not big compared to Moscow, it's, because Moscow is as big as the Netherlands in terms of the population, right? You have 17 million people here. I, yesterday I heard that you have 20 million in Moscow. Okay, so, but, and this is also not so very big. I don't know what the, the area is of. Moscow, but uh, from, from here to here it's about four hours by car. It's about uh, 400 kilometers, I would say. This is about 200, right? So it's really small. And then it's, it's even more impressive, I think, uh, and I hope you agree with me, that they collected data at all these sites. Mm -hmm. right? So 424 locations in the Netherlands, which is a tiny country. Yeah? It's an impressive piece of work, and it was uh, collected uh, between 19, 1980 and uh, say 19 or almost 2000 but most of the data collection was done in a period of about four years but a massive amount of work because everything was so people went to the people and you know, you know how it is right it's not really uh, i mean we have all facilities right you go to people's homes but still you have to go there bring your dictaphone record uh, the data then after having an interview, had an interview of a few hours you go back home and you listen to it and then you know how long it takes to transcribe everything right one minute of speech takes one hour of transcription, right? And you have a few hours of transcription per location, so it took years and years and years. And the only thing I do is I get the data and I can analyze it, which is really nice, right? This is why I do what I do and I don't do what you do. <laughs> uh, but I mean, we're also making some tools so you can actually do what I do without knowing uh, everything about it. Yeah? And that's what this lecture is about. Okay, so uh, uh, then sampling. Uh, so the analytical steps, very similar to what we did, right? So we obtain the aggregate Lambertine distances between each of the locations, right? So that's 424 times 423 divided by 2. So there's 90,000 pairs of locations. And each comparison between a pair of varieties, so two locations, uh, involves 562, that's the number of words, and times about five, on average, segments per word. Uh, comparison, so that's about 250 million <coughs> second comparisons in total. So it was off a factor of two. Uh, so what we have is a 424 times 424 table, which all has these linguistic differences. Uh, and then what we can do is visualize these. And since it's geographical data, it's nice to visualize it on a map. Right? So what we can do is visualize it then directly, which is of course hard if you have this big table. We can also see groups, right, to see if there are dialect areas. Uh, or if there are continuum-like relationships, right? And the most uh, uh, the methods I will discuss are cluster-based analysis, which I really, really hate and use it as well, uh, and multidimensional scaling, which I really like. And I will also uh, tell why I don't like cluster analysis. Right? Sometimes you see papers which discuss uh, this cluster analysis, and hey, see, we have a cluster here, a cluster here, a cluster here, and they're going to talk about this, uh, the clusters as if they were reality. But I will show you that they're not. Yeah. In some, only in some cases, they're really the uh, So, <coughs> I visualize all the distances. So I have this big table of 424 times 424 locations. <coughs> and what I'm doing now is I'm drawing a line between every pair of locations. And the color of the line indicates how big the distances are. If the distances are large, right, so if they're not very similar, the line is yellowish, if they are very similar, the line is very dark, right? So in this way you can see some kind of grouping emerge, right? So you see that these are very highly connected, right? And not connected to outside uh, areas, which makes sense because this is a Frisian language, it's really a different language, has a different status in the Netherlands, it's also an official language, at least of the province, so if you go to the uh, municipality you can talk in Frisian, right? You don't have to talk Dutch. Uh, well, here you see some more connections here as well. Uh, there's this line here, which really separates the, uh, what is it? So this is the low Saxon dialect area, and this is the low Franconian dialect area. And it, it is, there are big rivers here, which really separate this area. So you see some kind of structure, but really this is a mess. No? 
I mean, you can see something with some fantasy and some knowledge about the situation, but otherwise it's, it's quite hard. Uh, so what I do like is a so-called reference point map, right? So you pick a very special reference and say, suppose you are a person living in this, living in this area, how do you see the other areas? And then the lighter it is, the more similar, the darker it is, the more different, right? So you would see if you live somewhere here in Drenthe, which is uh, the province south of Groningen here, then you would see that this area is fairly similar, but here it's really different, and Frisian is also really different. Right? But of course, so this simply picks one column in your 424 times 424 table, right? and then colors all the other locations according to the distance from that point. But to actually vi visualize the whole data, we would need 424 of these maps, right? one for every location as your reference, which is also a bit much. Right? It doesn't fit in the joke. Right? So, what can we do? Well, we can do the highly inadequate cluster analysis. I will show it to you because it's often, very often used. Right? It's really problematic, and I will tell you why it's problematic. So, if you take home one thing, right, take it home that cluster analysis is really problematic. So, anybody, if you read the paper, it's a cluster analysis, you think it's really problematic. Right? <laughs> so, that's, then that's, uh, that's uh, uh, profit. Okay, so, but I will show you how cluster analysis works because, it's, it's, I mean, the ideas behind it are, are sound. Uh, so it can be used, can really like not very highly, but can can be used to determine dialect areas, right? So what is the procedure? Well, you have this big table, 424 times 424. We select the smallest difference in this table, and we say, okay, these two sides are most similar, so we merge them, right? So then they're one group, and then. You do the same thing again. You have a new table, you fuse uh, different, uh, uh, the smallest distances, right? Repeatedly, repeatedly, until you have the, the number of clusters you want. Yeah? Uh, right, so uh, there's some choices, and that makes clustering a bit uh, uh, fishy. In the sense that what do you do, right? So we have this 424 with 424, then we find the smallest distance, <coughs> and that's straightforward, it's always the same. Right, and then you have location A and B, and you fuse them. And then there's the question, how do you determine the distance between this new fuse cluster of A and B and all the other points? Is it the minimum difference? Is it the average distance? Is it the maximum distance? Is it some kind of other measure? Uh, different choices. And unfortunately, these different choices result in completely different clusters. And that's the problem of clustering. One of the problems of clustering. Uh, okay, so you can repeat this whole procedure of merging. So say that we have decided on the, the method to uh, calculate distances between the fused points and uh, the other points. We repeat that, repeat that, repeat that until there's only one cluster left. And I will give you an example to make it clear. So here we have one of our distance tables, right? So I, for simplicity, I'm not showing you the 424 by 424. It doesn't fit on the slide, but uh, we get the job done with only five locations as well. Right? So the table is symmetrical, right? distances between Grau and Haarlem are the same as Haarlem and Grau because we always flip the uh, locations, right? one is first up and the other one is down in the alignment and vice versa, so it's always symmetrical. So these are linguistic differences, right? not geographical distances. So Grau compared to Haarlem, that's the distance of 41, uh, Grau to Delft is 44, Grau to Hatten is 45, etc. Yeah? So if we look in this table, the smallest distance is found between Haarlem and Delft. So we will fuse these two points, yeah? Haarlem and Delft. We consider Haarlem and Delft as one cluster. Right? So we look at Haarlem and Delft compared to the distances to the three remaining points. So Grau Haarlem is a distance of 41. Right? So Haarlem Grau 41. So it's simply taken from the previous table. <coughs> you see all the dif distances for, for Delft. And what I'm now doing is I'm simply setting the, the distance from the cluster uh, as the average of the two points in the cluster. Yeah? So this one will be, Haarlem and Delft for Grau will be 41 plus 44 divided by 2 is 42.5, Hatten will be 35.5 and Hatten 37. Yeah? So simply the average. It's a choice I made, but uh, for the purpose of this. So we get a new table, we have Grau, and then we have a cluster of Haarlem and Delft, which have all the distances we just calculated, right? 40, what is it, uh, 35 point, uh, 
537 and 42.5, right? Those are the values we really calculated. The other ones are still the original values. Now we look again for the smallest distance and we find the distance between Lochem and Hotten, right? And we consider Hotten and Lochem as a well cluster. We do the same step here, right? Hotten and Lochem, we look at the distances compared to the other two locations, we then take the average. So the distance from Hotten and Lochem to Kau is 45 plus 46 divided by 2. That's 45.5, Haarlem and Delft 35.5, and uh, Lochem to Haarlem and Delft 37, so the average is 36.25. Is this all clear? Right? Uh, so we get a new table now which has Haarlem and Delft and Hattem and Lochem grouped, and then we have Grau. So we now find again the smallest distance between Haarlem and Delft and Hattem and Lochem, right? Because that's this one, and we consider Haarlem and Delft and Hattem and Lochem as one plus, right? So we group the two. Right, so we have the distance from Hatem and Delft to Kau is 42.5, the distance from Hatem and Lochem to Kau is 45.5, average of that is 44. Right? So we now get a new uh, group, which is Grau and Haarlem, Delft, Hatem and Lochem. Right? So if we would make a final grouping, we would group Grau with the remaining ones. So we then end up with one cluster containing all the data points, right? So what we did, we first fused, I think, uh, Hatem and uh, Haarlem and Delft. What did we fuse first? Yeah, we first fused Haarlem and Delft, then we fused Hatem and Lochem, and then we fused Grau. Oh, we should be vice versa. Uh, I will correct it. Okay, so can we visualize this, this clustering? Yes, we can. It's called a dendrover. So what you see here is all the five locations. You see uh, the, these, the distances between the locations, right? Uh, so if you look at here, you see when they are fused, right? So these single lines reflect the distance between the two locations, right? So and this one is 16, right? And that's also the distance which you see in the plot, I think. Uh, the smallest distance was 16, yeah? Right? And then we had the distance between Hatem and Lochem, which was 20. So you see where, where they are grouped, and then you saw the other distance between these two groups, uh, where they were grouped, is this, and then finally this is the point where everything is grouped. So you see a hierarchy, right? So you see that these two are most similar, then these two, then this group, and then finally the final place to come. Is this clear? Yeah. So this is a way of visualizing the clustering and showing you the hierarchy. Uh, and it shows you also how different they are, so it quantifies the differences. And now we can visualize, right? Uh, so this is a visualization. If we do clustering in four groups, we simply get a Frisian area, which we would expect since it's a different language. We get the Limburg area here. We get some kind of mess here, which is really a mess because these are transcription, uh, uh, transcriber problems. Many people, many different transcribers in this area. So actually the only thing that you see here is differences between transcribers, not the real life differences, which uh, sometimes is a okay, pain. That's what. Well. So now all the issues with clustering, I say some, but they're really a lot. Clustering is very, very sensitive to the data, right? So if you have very small changes in your input table, you will get a completely different clustering. So that's a problem, yeah? because our methods of calculating differences are not absolute, not perfect, right? So if you consider that, that there might be noise, eh? some transcribers might have transcribed something, not completely correctly, so there's always noise. So that means that if small changes can change your clustering, it means that well, there's likely an incorrect, some kind of incorrect uh, things in your data, and then you get completely different clustering. But that's not what we want, right? Because we want something which is the true clustering. So as I said, cluster algorithms vary in how they determine distance of fused groups to other data points, right? So-called single link takes the minimum value, right? So you have two points and the distance from the cluster to all the other points is simply the minimum of the two. And you have complete link, which is the maximum of the two. You have UPGMA, unweighted pair group mean average, uh, which is the average distance compared to all individual points. And then we have WPGMA, which is weighted pair group mean average, which is the average distance compared to all groups rather than the individual points. Uh, and then we have Ward's method, which dialectologists really love because it gives you balanced clusters, and that's what we want. But it's not necessarily what is actually in your data. Uh, and I 
will give you an illustration of the words. So I will show you now already, so this is like a teaser of GetMap. And we will get to learn, uh, get to, if this works, eh? no guarantees. Because what sometimes happens is that uh, our server crashes when uh, I, I give these courses, which might have happened now, actually. Internet is good to be used. Used. demo I made uh, associated with the paper. It's BBC Voices data, so it's lexical data. So uh, uh, lots of uh, people in uh, Great Britain and uh, Scotland, etc., they were asked, uh, how do you uh, uh, pronounce a small river? Or what is the word you use for a small river, etc. Yeah. Uh, lexical variation. Uh, and I will simply show you the post maps. That's the only thing I'm showing you. Yeah. Uh, takes a bit of time. Yeah, so it also gives you a warning, yeah, which is nice. So it warns you that actually what you're seeing is a big mess. Uh, so here you see uh, a, a cluster, right? It uses a group average, so this is uh, a UPDMA, I think. Uh, so, but I can change the clustering. So you see, you, what you get is simply a big chunk, and then there's two sides which are different, right? Uh, I change my settings. Oh wait, now my clustering looks completely different. And now you use words method. And hopefully this, this shows you why dialectologists like this. Yeah? Because you get very nicely balanced clusters. <laughs> yeah? There's another issue, which I did not tell you about, uh, which is how to determine the right number of clusters. Because I can also say, oh, give me eight clusters. Just for the fun of it, I think there are eight clusters. I saw a paper where somebody said, well, in Great Britain there are 20 clusters. And he showed a paper, with, uh, a, a, a thing with 20 clusters, which is really, I mean, it's, I mean there might be 20 clusters, but well, you get completely different mm. results if you use a different method. Right? <coughs> so it takes some time because you need to calculate. And you get a completely different cluster. Right? Mm. So, uh, different issues, right? It's very sensitive to noise, which I did not show you yet. Uh, it's sensitive to using the, the method, but it's also sensitive to the number of clusters you want. Because saying the number of clusters you have is nothing more than actually cutting here in this Den program at different spots. Right? If you want two clusters, right, the only thing what I need to do is cut here. I cut this line, and I have two clusters. Right? If I want to have three clusters, then I also cut here, then I have three clusters. If I want to have four clusters, then I also cut here, then I have four clusters. If I want to have five clusters, then I cut here, then I have five clusters. If I want to have six clusters, I additionally cut here, and then I have six clusters. And so on, and so on, right? So I, you can have as many clusters as you want. But are they true clusters? Well, that's, that's well, it depends, yeah? And you see the demogram is not fixed because it depends on the method. Right? So the demogram now looks completely different. Mm. Yeah? Really dependent on the method. Yeah? Okay, so uh, where's my presentation? Okay. So fortunately there is a solution and it's called fuzzy cluster. So, or bootstrap cluster, it doesn't really matter, they're different, but they're in the same thing. So, what do you do? Well, you take your original distance matrix, this 424 by 424 matrix. What you do is you add a little bit of noise. So, you, with, for, to each of the cells which have a distance, you, with a certain change, you add some noise. And the noise is uh, uh, normally distributed with a certain mean. And a certain uh, the mean is zero, and a certain standard deviation, right? And the wider you make the standard deviation, the more noise is added on average. Uh, so you add some noise, so you have a second table, uh, we again add some random noise, have a third table, 
etc., etc. We do this thing 1,000 times, right? So we have 1,000 matrices of distances, and then we, for each of these, we cluster this new distance matrix. So we have 1,000 different clusterings, and then we simply count how often each cluster has appeared. So how often were these two points, or four points, or ten points clustered together? And stable clusters will appear in many rounds. And then you can also combine the different algorithms to do this, right? So you use all the algorithms to cluster, so you have three times 1,000 things. And then you get something which I think is, is better. And you visualize this in a probabilistic dendrogram. So what is a probabilistic dendrogram? Something like this. So you would see clusters, right? So this is a cluster, this whole uh, bunch of uh, data points which has occurred in 86 out of the 100, or 860 out of 1,000 ones, right? So it's fairly stable. And you see also 100, that means always these two locations are clusters, irrespective of what amount of noise you add, which means that they're very stable. So they're probably are very likely together, right? So this is, gives you a different uh, approach to clustering. If you want to visualize something like this, it doesn't look as nice, of course, right? So you can see strong borders, for locations which are always clustered together, and you can see some weaker borders if clustered up if locations on opposite sides of the borders are also clustered together in some of these rounds. Right? And you still see these messy transcriber things here. It's really not noise. Yeah, it is noise, but it's very stable noise. Okay, so now we get to the nicer parts. I don't know if I'm going to speak for Yeah, question. So yeah, I have a question about the thing with the clustering. Um, yeah. Because uh, as we have shown, we cannot uh, rely on the, like, the basic methods. But with this new method, you can see that it's stable, but we still have no... Like, we, we cannot uh, calculate the accuracy of the method because we cannot. Am I right? So we, we yeah. cannot... We so, I mean... The, 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 you're asking sort of a perceptual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so what, what people have been doing is, for example, the arrow method, right? So that they go to people who live in a certain region, so draw an arrow to the locations which are most similar to yours, right? And then you would see opposite arrows at, at borders. Uh, so there are different ways of validating clustering, right? And the, the, yeah, the question is also. But is it, uh, the question were, were is it, if it is stable, we can still have no evidence that it's like that it's working. I no, guess. I, I, no, I would say that you would have some evidence that it's working at least on the, the data you're providing, mm -hmm. right? So perceptual data is also not really a gold standard, right? Because people have certain shibboleths uh, which they think of when hearing somebody else and thinking they're completely different than us. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it's, uh, it might also be highly subjective and based on to which group do you want to belong, right? I mean, you know that you're living in a Catholic village here, the village next to you is Protestant, you don't like the people, uh, you think you speak very differently, but actually you speak very similar, right? I mean, these things, so it's... it's but, no, certainly uh, perceptual data and uh, uh, clustering is something you could... Uh, so the clustering on the basis of your actual data is something you could compare, right? But I, I think it's hard to determine what is a real cluster, and it's always, because as I will show you, the borders are generally gradual, right? The farther you go, the, the similar, uh, or the, the closer you are, the similar people speak. And then sometimes there are some hard borders, language borders, for example, but sometimes also not. So it's very hard to determine what is the what is the real cluster. I just don't use cluster. <coughs> but but yeah, you have to know what it is since many people use it especially in dialectology, and I guess also if you do language documentation like you, you want to see what are the clusters, right? So you do cluster <coughs> But now at least you're aware of the issues which you have with clustering. Right? Uh, I have five minutes, so let's see how far we get. So what I do like the method is multidimensional scaling, because we're not attempting to make any clusters. So it's a dimension reduction technique. So if you've ever heard of principal components analysis, singular value decomposition, it's all fairly similar. The idea is that we have this huge table, right, 424 times 424, and we want to make it a smaller table. So 424 times 3. So rather than having 424 rows and 424 columns, I'm making 424 rows and only 3 columns. Can you do that? Yes, I can. 
Why can you do that? Well, because there's lots of structure in our data. Right? So, for example, if you have two places in Groningen, which is in the north, right, so here, and we have one place here, right, we know, right, on the basis of our data, we can see that uh, G1 and G2 uh, are very similar, yeah, almost, almost identical. And then I have calculated one distance of one of these places in Groningen to the other one in Lindbergh, far away, and we see it's very different. But if we have only these two values, right, then it actually also allows us to predict the difference between the second place in Groningen and the other one. Because we know, well, the distance of these two places is very small, the distance to this one place is very large of this group of this equation. Uh, so probably the distance between the other Groningen place and the Lindbergh place will be very high. Right. Actually, it turns out that that really is the case. Yeah? Much structure. So, the result of MBS is a reduced number of values characterizing how each row, so every location, uh, uh, reflects itself in the space of all these uh, uh, other locations. So, you have only three coordinates, right? every place has only three coordinates, and the more similar the coordinates are, the more similar the locations are. And the nice thing of this, uh, this MBS, if you have three columns, you can also say, let's assign a color to every, the first, uh, first column is red, second column green, third column blue. Okay, and then we can assign a color to each location, and similar colors to not similar varieties. So explain variance, that indicates how good is our MBS visualization. So how much of the variability in our original matrix, matrix is uh, uh, still kept. And it turns out that it's about 90% or so. Right? So only with three columns, we still have 90% of the original variation in our data. Right? And I'll go and show you an example. So here we have the same, uh, the same uh, uh, data as before. Right? Distances, linguistic distances between the location. So now we position the five local dialects in two dimensional space. We'll first do it in two dimensions, later in three. Such so that the distances in this space reflect those in the matrix as close as possible. And the result would be something like this. Right? So if I were to reduce my five, uh, uh, my five point, uh, 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 my five uh, locations to this, this we get something like this. So Haren and Delft are very similar, and Hatem and Bochum are very similar, and they are both very different to Graf. So you can see some uh, resemblance with the cluster-based dendrogram we had before, right? Uh, and in this plot, already 88% of the original variation of all these distances are incorporated. Uh, so I can also do three dimensions by adding a color. Right? Now you have a color as well, so it's just uh, how, how orange it is. If I divide it into three dimensions, right, x, y, and color, then I already have 96.4% of my data. Right? So really I have almost, almost uh, my original data is reflected in this graph. And that's very nice, I think. So, when you scale to three dimensions, each dialect is represented by three values, so x, y, and z, and by assigning a color, each dialect gets its own color. And then we can visualize this dialect landscape as a dialect continuum. And then we get something like this. And this looks beautiful, not? Right? It's almost like art. Right? But, so the nice thing is that you see that it's a gradual change, right? The farther you go from here, this green area, to here, the more purple it becomes. Right, you do see some kind of well, quite strong edge here, right, which really reflects that this is low Saxon, this is low Franconian. You see a very clear edge here of the Frisian language compared to the Dutch. Right? Also makes sense that people are educated in Frisia here, it's one of the, the taught uh, uh, languages. Uh, right? and you see here that it's really, it's really a continuum. You cannot really talk about uh, a, a, a somewhere a, a border here, it's simply a continuum. And you still see this mess here, right? all these colors which really reflect, reflect different uh, transcribers. And the explained variance in this data is about 85%. So of my original matrix, 85% is reflected in this uh, map. And now we'll have a break, which is exactly at 20 plus. So after the break, you can work a little bit. So, I, yeah, that's a break.